Hi everyone, Rybone here back with another one. This week's video, we're going to take a look at the most recent 7-zip vulnerability. This really isn't a vulnerability, it's just not a mark of the web pass-through. And what that means is that if you archive something multiple times, mark of the web is not passed from the embedded file all the way down. And what that means is that smart screen will not fire. There's phishing risk here because 7-zip very common to be sent in. I'm going to illustrate that for you. I'm also going to illustrate a very, very obvious uh, EDR detection miss here that can come with this as well. So just in general, CVE 2025-0411 is, is our vulnerability. It has a score of 7 because, well, it does require quite a bit of interaction to get it to go. Uh, this was originally found by the Zero Day Initiative and then rescored by NVD, same score of 7 and 7. So it's a high. This is an area in your org you may not be paying attention to. 7-zip, it's probably installed anywhere. And if you don't have the most recent version, this can happen to you. All right, so let's take a look at our first host. Our first host here is Win10 Host 4. And we're going to create a loader object with the vulnerability in it or the Mark of the Web bypass. Now, Mark of the Web is an alternate data stream that's applied to a file when it's downloaded from the web. Right? And that triggers things on a system. It blocks macros, it triggers smart screen, it does quite a bit. So if you can bypass that, you can get by the first layer of controls and sometimes by the second layer. And that's what I'm going to illustrate for you here. So we're going to start with our loader CPP file. This is a simple C++ file, and it is a reverse shell callback. So basically, this is the most obvious callback you could basically ever write. The IP address is in clear text. The port is in clear text. I'm calling IOStream, Windows H, and WinSoc2. Uh, if you come down here, you can see I am calling cmd.exe. Uh, and basically, when you get down here into main, it runs my reverse shell function. I don't know if it gets more obvious a name than reverse shell, but that's what we're doing here, right? I'm going to embed this in multiple layers of 7 zip And in doing so, we're going to see if we can get it by a defender. So let's give it a shot. So we'll go to tools here, command line, and developer command prompt. And we're going to compile this, right? We're going to take this and make this into an executable. So to do that in Visual Studio, you simply go into the file folder that you're in, type CL, and you give it loader CPP. So it's going to compile this executable now. And there you go. We have loader executable out. So the next step is now we're just going to compress this. But to do so first, we want to give this a name that the user might you know, click, right? So let's give it something a little bit more juicy than loader.exe. We'll simply call it, please run me. Please run me. Just like that. Now we're going to send this to 7-zip. We're going to add it to an archive. So we'll add, please run me, 7-z. So this is normal process, right? The normal process. You would archive something up. We're going to rename this to please double click me. And I'll show you why in a second. So please double click me. Now we 7-zip it again. And this is where the vulnerability comes into play. Mark of the Web doesn't pass all the way down through multiple layers. So we'll go ahead and do this. We're going to add that. We're going to delete the first one just to make sure that we don't accidentally do that. We'll delete our executable just to make sure that's not accidentally grabbed. And then we're going to rename this to whatever we want our user to think, right? free Bitcoin, anything that will entice the user to open this file. So we'll simply upload this to updog now. We're going to choose our file. And this is going to be free Bitcoin 7z. We'll upload that. And we're going to grab our link and we're going to jump over to another host. And the point of this is just simply testing the level that this will work at. This is very obvious. Anybody worth their salt is not going to click on free Bitcoin, right? But the point here is just to see, does it work? I'll give you a more real scenario 
here in just a second. But let's start with what we have. And we're just going to take our first scenario here. And that's first, we're going to download the file and see what happens. So we'll paste and go here. And it's trying to save it. So we'll save as. We're going to save free Bitcoin to download. So let's see, does anything fire? And it did not. Our next step over here, we're going to make sure we have a Netcat listener going on our Kali box. So we're going to clear this out. And we're going to do Netcat LVNP port 4444. We're going to do this a couple different scenarios here. But we'll go back to our Win10 host 2, Hal Jordan's machine. And then we're going to now open this. So we're going to open our free Bitcoin. OK, that's not working right. So we're going to go ahead and open archive here. We'll do please double click me. Please run me. And let's see what happens. Sometimes Defender eats this, sometimes it doesn't. It looks like it's not. In this case, I've had it eat it a couple of different times. I've had it just ignored a couple of times. Smart screen, nowhere to be found, right? So we come over to Cali, we've got a shell. And we can do, who am I? And there we go. We're Hal Jordan, right? So that worked. We got by Mark of the Web. So let's take a little deeper look at this, though. If I take Please Run Me and I copy it out, and we'll just drag it. It's probably the easiest way. Defender's probably going to fire now. But we have our please run me.executable here. And if I come over here to my command line and I go get content and I put in please run me, you can see there's no zone identifier. And that's why we got an error. If I look at the zone identifier of the file above this, the free Bitcoin file, notice I do have a zone identifier. So it did not take the zone identifier and pass it down. And that zone identifier is Marco Web. So that's how this works. Okay, so let's do a little more real scenario here. I'll come over here to our Cali box to start. We'll Start another shell. And the more real scenario, the one that we've seen adversaries use, is phishing. So let's come over here to Hal Jordan's email. He wants to leave the company. So he has an employment offer from Evil Corp. Attaches your employment offer with Evil Corp. Please download the file, the following link, and open it. It requires seven zip. It may require multiple unencryptions. So you just kind of preface it. Right. This is the same thing adversaries would do. So they click the link, clicks the link. What happens? Save as. OK. We'll save as. We'll see what it's going to do. Doesn't look like it's going to do anything. Come over here to explore. We're going to open our employee agreement. It may error because it did the same thing earlier. Yeah, something's up with 7-zip on this one. We'll just go 7-zip and open archive. Normally that double click would work. And then we have please double click once again. And here's our employee agreement. Now, if this has Mark of the Web on it, it won't let me run macros. But let's see. We're going to go ahead and open employee agreement. This is the latest version of Microsoft 365. And it gives me the option to enable content. So the fact that it gives me the option to enable content means that Mark of the Web is not present here, right? So also, just so everybody's on the same page, Defender is on. And you can see it's fired a couple times here. But if we look at the settings, real-time protection, cloud delivered, automatic, and tamper, all there. So now I quite simply enable content because, well, the user's going to do that because I told them to here with my DocuSign document, you need to unencrypt your employment offer. And then we're going to come over to Cali and we have a reverse shell. So this is the vulnerability. A little bit nasty. The risk is phishing. And how gullible are your users? Will they click multiple times? Will they get all the way into a file like this and follow instructions from some random person? The answer is yes. There is somebody in your company that will do this. So 
just be aware this is a real threat that's out there right now that adversaries are using. Okay, so we've illustrated our threat. I'm just going to make sure it works. We'll do who am I? We can see we're Hal Jordan here. Another interesting thing about this particular shell, if they close it, because I've migrated into cmd.exe, it still works. So if I come over here to Cali, I can run another command. Uh, we'll just do uh, hostname. There we go. We can see we're host to win 10. So that is the red. The blue detection. So in this case, we have bypassed EDR. So that means our detection needs to be a secondary measure. Hopefully you have something that's defense in depth, right? Or your EDR allows you to hunt for these kinds of things. The very first and most easy way to detect this is a pretty common rule that I would hope you have in your sim, right? Now this looks for process execution 4688 or one, which is Sysmon, and process executable cmd.exe or PowerShell, and the parent process name Excel. So in other words, Excel launch cmd.exe or PowerShell. That's bad all day, right? You don't want Excel doing that. So if we search our sim here for this, now that's the wrong data view. Let me get into logs. And if we search our sim, we can see right here, here is Excel launching cmd.exe. Now this implies two things. Number one, you're logging your workstations where users are clicking email. If you don't have that going to sim, you're blind. EDR was blinded here, right? Defender was blinded. It might see it, it might not. If your EDR allows you to hunt at this level, maybe you have some task that's running hunt queries in the background, that could suffice as well. But if you take a look here, it's very obvious from our log. If I expand this out, you can see Excel right here, process command line at launch CMD. That's very bad. You don't ever want to see that. PowerShell or CMD are both bad from Excel. Now this could be Excel and Word, anything that can run macros. This is the best detection of the two. Now, if you're in a very tight environment and you know that your user should never be launching an executable from 7-zip, you can do a secondary query that's much like this. And this one, we're looking for 4688 or 1, but we're obfuscating out just any executable coming from 7-zip. Should your users be getting 7-zip files and running executables? Maybe, maybe not. If you take a look at this, now we can see our please run me here coming from 7-zip file manager. Another pretty obvious method of detection here for the blue side. And right there, please run me and our 7-zip file manager. Now, the reason I did 7-z in stars is because 7-zip has seven, it has three different files that can open a 7-zip archive. So you need to kind of make sure that just anything 7-z from the parent process name. All right, so that's the red and the blue in purple team. Once again, thank you for watching. Catch me at a SANS class. Um, coming up on San Antonio SANS class, so register if you're planning on attending. That would be great. Uh, otherwise, once again, hack the planet to defend better.